From Blockbusters to Algorithms, How AI is Changing the Face of Entertainment, moderated by Creative Media Chairman Peter Chatty. Ready for some AI? But we're going to keep it meta. We're, we're not just meta. But we're going to get into a lot of the philosophical questions, too, that come with this in entertainment and creativity. But uh, listen, what a difference a year makes. Last year at The Wrap, there was, generative AI was on nobody's radar screen. None whatsoever. So it's, it's, we have a great panel today, so I'm going to introduce it. But we have a lot of ground to cover. We're not going to get into deep introductions. We're going to get right into it. So let's start with inviting Shira Lazar onto this... Onto the stage, Shira is the leading voice in the creator economy. Shira, here. And now Toby Campion, who's the founder of a great company that's an AI media company, Lore Machine. Rick Hack, the head of media and entertainment partnerships at Intel. At Intel. Dr. Moya McTeer who's the explainer with a capital AI and explain, explainer in chief of the Human Artistry Campaign, which is a coalition of over 150 yeah. media companies. In 30 countries around the world. Yeah, all focused on how AI is impacting creativity in the arts. Yeah, specifically generative AI. Okay, and then, I think this is right, Eric Opika, final, the final person on our stage? Yes, Eric, who's the president, chief strategy officer of Cineverse. Oh, so, sorry, Mark. Can't forget Mark, come on. Can't man. forget the creator. We have our great creator on, coming on stage, Mark Mothersbaugh, who is the co-founder, lead singer, and conceptualist of Devo, who's with us today. Sorry, Mark. Sorry about that. We're okay. No, sorry about that. Yeah, okay, forgive me. What a start. All right, so... We're going to get right into it, as I said. And everything in entertainment starts with uh, content first and the creator. So, Mark, I want to open it up with you. Yes, I want to open it up with you to understand just what your feelings are about generative AI. Okay. Um, I think it's going to be both good and bad for me. It's going to be good because... Uh, I love new technology and I love new tools to make art with, to make music with. And uh, I'm also seeing ways already how they're going to use it to um, lower my pay. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. Okay, so I want to dig a little bit deeper on that though. Um, Devo has always been tech forward as a, as, as a band. Um, you know, I followed the band very closely from the beginning. But tech forward, embracing technology and using that, and you're a conceptualist. So when you think about AI as, in your view, a good and a bad, how do you feel about someone who uses generative AI to create songs in the style of Mark Mothersbaugh or Devo and only being trained on Devo songs? Well, I hope they do a good one. <laughs> I hope they do good songs. but. Um, yeah, that's the kind of stuff, you know, that I think we need to um, get some rules going. So I'm, I'm, I haven't read all anything about the writer's uh, deal yet to know what they've agreed to and, or been offered, and I don't know what's going to happen with SAG after. And I'm curious about all that. I'm, I have the AF of M, uh, American Federation of Musicians, which is the lamest, I think caterers have a better union than us. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, we have the weakest union, and uh, we're, we're definitely at the bottom of the totem pole. But um, yeah, I'm curious to see where it's going. Are you using AI right now in what you're doing? Uh, I've been working in AI for about three years, but not in music, oddly enough. I've been um, taking, I do visual art every day. And I've been taking these images and um, experimenting with them with AI, and I'm really having fun with that. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a there's a guy. He was my sound man uh, when I first put Devo together uh, with uh, Jerry and Bob and Bob. 
and uh, Jim, my little brother, we, when we first put Devo together, I had this guy working as my sound man, and he toured with us, and then he, he uh, used a lot of art bands back in the 80s, 90s, and then he started working at museums, and then his brother got sick, and he went back to Ohio to take care of his brother, and he got into AI and got me into it. And we started taking Devo images and um, mutating them because um, we're, you know, we're kind of really interested in, in um, AI and, and positive mutation. And uh, we had just started working on some animated Devo footage uh, that looked really incredible. It's just like the technology isn't there yet, but it's every month it gets more amazing. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he went up and died on me about four weeks ago. So I know uh, it's yeah, awful. So, yeah. so um, I'm still working in it, and uh, I'll get to music eventually. Yeah, I mean one one thing, uh, you know, obviously um, Devo, but Mark is a very well known and prolific film scorer. And so when you're talking about motion picture and t series scoring, and you think about generative AI using some of the recipes being trained on Mark's scores, like that opens up uh, you know, a number of issues. We'll, we'll dig into that. But you mentioned the WGA strike and the SAG strike. And um, Moya, I'd like to ask you, because, well, you represent over 150 different companies. Um, SAG is a part of it. Yeah, SAG is a part. So, so tell us the latest of what the resolution was for the WGA and then what things are looking like for, for SAG and kind of the rules of the game, if any, that have been established by the WGA. Peter, I wish I could answer that, but I'm not in those rooms. Um, I'm not a member of either WGA or SAG, but I can say that uh, because SAG is a member of the Human Artistry Campaign, we very much support what they're fighting for, um, especially with artificial intelligence. So I've, I've read through some of the WGA negotiations and the contract they have. It seems pretty favorable in terms of what the um, networks are allowed to use AI for. And um, I, everyone I know in the WGA is very happy about that, but I don't, I don't know what SAG is doing right now. Okay. Uh, does anybody else here have Hi. some insight? Do you have some Well, insight? I'll give a shout out to Francesca Ramsey, who uh, does great summaries of this. And I actually did watch one of her videos <laughs> before this. Good. So some of the high level, because also I'm not in the WGA, and, um, but I do report about this. I have a newsletter called The Alpha. Subscribe for weekly news. I'm in. Um, but they said that you can't be forced to use AI. Uh, you can't have a script and then force a writer to fix it. You know, like if you have an AI script and then say, oh, yeah, now you add in your creative writing and fix this, but you're allowed to use AI as long as you're also, you have disclosure. So the studios can, and the writers can use AI with disclosure. So that's some of the high level. Well, you know. But it affects credits too, that's the other thing. So oh yeah, yeah, oh, we have. Uh, <laughs> if you use AI, it doesn't uh, impact the writer's credit for first version, et cetera. So that's a really cool So the credit, okay, yeah. Thank well, you. and the studios are, yeah, uh, in support of having humans involved so that there's copyright protection and exclusivity, of course. So, uh, because copyright, actually, there was something set that you can't copyright or there was something about copyright the actual script or it came out of the AI, but you can copyright the prompt. Right, because that was made by yeah. a human. AI, right. AI only is not copyrightable. <clears throat> Th yes. That's one of the kind of the rules of the game. Yeah. And well, so any part that's made with AI isn't copyrightable because it has to be made by a human. The to human get who that created copyright. the prompt, that is the copyrightable thing. Mm -hmm. And you can split it up into the different proportions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I want to. I'm going to lay out a. a, a I'm curious if you guys all agree, agree or disagree. Feel free to disagree. So setting the stage, and then we're going to get into some of the uses of media and entertainment um, with generative AI. But these are some of the things that I see, and I think that they're kind of universal, but I may be wrong. Practical realities. AI tech can't be stopped. You know, that's one of the things that technology grows. It just does. And so no matter whether people try to limit it, um, it, it can't be Disagree. stopped. Okay. <laughs> okay. You okay. don't get a point okay. for that. So <laughs> I love that. Okay, I'm I'm gonna lay out my four, and then <laughs> I didn't know we were supposed wow. to wait. I love it. It's an AI arm, 
AI arms race right now. So the commercial realities rule the day. There are very few incentives to slow down development. AI will impact all sectors of the entertainment industry. And not even the leaders of the companies who are creating the AI, like the open AI, fully understand how generative AI spits out, well, for, that's a pejorative way of putting it, but you know what I mean, comes up with its, um, its creative work. So those are four, that's what I see out there, but you disagree with the first one at least. So tell me more. Jump right in. Yeah. Okay. So there's somebody in our audience today that's actually responsible and, and collaborating with Intel. Um, it's uh, Ilki Demir, who's a doctor as well as a senior research scientist um, that's working on a service that we're going to be deploying, we hope, or at least it's, it's in the works uh, at the end of the year, um, detecting fake content. So how do we use AI to deter AI? Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, even, Ilki over there. I have it's a question though, Rick, because our, some of that tech still isn't, is, has been shown not to work recently, but the, yours it, is right. going to. <laughs> yeah, I'm Oops, sure you're okay, as well. Here we go. Right. I want to hear. The gloves are off. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> let's go. So <laughs> we got seven picks to the audience. So, so we, um, you know, and, and look, it's it's not a, it's it's not perfect, and Ilki can probably go into more detail about this, but it involves the elements of blood flow, it involves the elements of eye gaze, it involves the elements of movement, it involves all these different pieces that make up this algorithm that ultimately will tell you the percentage of the likelihood that you have fake or something that's uh, the real type of content that's being broadcast. So, I mean, obviously we're in an election year. I think everybody's concerned about these types of things. So I think this is, you know, I mean, to quote Spider-Man with deep, you know, with what is great powers comes great responsibility. That's why we're here, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. part of the why Intel does what we do, we build AI into everything that we do. So um, it, maybe it's not perfect yet. No, it was, it was more referencing what's happening in education right now and yeah. all, all the writing and students using AI to write and they've shown like some of these tools to make sure that it's not AI, it's just not working, which actually encourages us to find more unique ways to teach and do the things that we do. That's, I would say, the pro, the glass half full. I think one of the deep ironies of the fact that a lot of that tech is obviously still emerging, and I think an effort yeah. is better than no effort, but um, yeah. the very pretext with which we found ourselves in the scenario where we're able to synthesize massive amounts of text is because we copied it to the internet in the first place. And so the failure of a lot of those tools are actually, ironically, because we didn't effectively copy enough data to then, so it's, you're, you're at the horns of a dilemma right there. Um, and so I think it's only fair to give the anti-plagiarism software a little bit of leeway at first. No. <laughs> um, this, this is also uh, where I think blockchain tech could really help with yeah. deep fakes. And um, where if, if you have um, a authentic, authentication with the content, um, it could be helpful to see the source of it. And You're I, talking about provenance, yes. right? The, yeah. the, yeah, and, the source of the And also, just, uh, so when we're talking about the media and entertainment business and content, um, you have cases like uh, some of the legal cases out there for infringement. Sarah Silverman, um, her book, it's one of, of you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of works that are being s scraped for training of the you know, LLM, and there's litigation of that, and there's a whole host of these. Getty Images doing that with, with photos and images, and you know, this gets into some of the technology of identifying that. L let's stop there and ask you about that too, Rick, about the technology for identifying what has been part of the training model, and then I have a follow-up for that too. So Are you involved with that? So the technology identifying part of the training model. So we're, we're the underpinnings of all these different models. We're not necessarily, yeah. in some cases, creating the creative models, but we're, how do we accelerate that? How do we reduce uh, the power? How do we keep it more ethical, as we talked about earlier? Um, how, how do we uh, drive those efficiencies on every, in every single device or type of device, from, from client or PC to cloud, to the, you know, the edge, all those, all those avenues, right? Um, do you want an example, maybe an example of some? Sure, give an example. So um, everything from, 
I mean, we're starting off years ago, you talked about the history of some of the AI work that, that's been going on, but on, on the entertainment side, so in the movie The Meg, if you remember this big, giant Megalodon shark, <laughs> right? So they, years ago, um, it was based on a book by Steve Altman, and they could never figure out, a, figure out a way to sort of create something that was better than one of the greatest you know, shark movies of all time. So how do you create something that's really realistic, that, that really um, drives that interest and creates that type of event and, and, and builds that um, authentic looking creature under, underwater and this megalodon shark. So they used, a, they used a software and we were the underpinnings of the compute behind that, but it's because it, they said every time they tried to do it for almost 20 years, it looked like a sardine. So they couldn't figure out how to, how to, how to make that happen. So lots of compute driving those machines, those, those visual artists, those creative artists for whether it be image work, scan line, um, uh, double negative, all those different teams that were utilizing um, and creating those imagery, but then ultimately building and making something that looks from the muscle on top of the skin and everything else with, with using physics in order to create those simulations of those creatures and characters. So and, and Eric, I want to get into how you are using AI today in your business, but Mark, I want to get back to one of the questions that, that harkens back to some of the litigation going on and the questions that are trying to be resolved by the courts that are ill-equipped to do these things, but nonetheless, that's where we go. And, and Moya, I want to ask you about Congress, too, because you've testified there. But do you feel if, if your songs, your creative work, is part of, um, is being scraped as part of the, you know, the training of the LLM. Do you consider that to be an infringement of your work? Let's say yes. I don't know, I haven't heard it. You know, I, I don't know what they sound like so far, but in a, you know, when people take pieces of songs and use them now, you have to pay for it. Yeah. So, you know, I think, I, th I say yeah, just pay for it. It's not that big a deal if you're, putting a song together and you're relying on uh, somebody else's song, you know, it's... And is this a topic that comes up when you're talking to other musicians who you work with or who, or who you know and other artists? Uh, no, they haven't been thinking about it because they're just all freaked out because of the strike. Uh, and, yeah. Because yeah. we're at the bottom of the... <laughs> we're at the end of the, of the, of the food chain, so, so it's like... We're waiting for the work to show up again. But, um, but you know, my, my feeling is, oh, damn it. OK. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like um, there's going to be, you know, th they have to make rules. And, uh, you know, like, I don't want them using my voice. I, I had somebody from a company that, that um, translates films from all over the world, most, in all the LA films, they translate them into every language. And, and this woman who I know works at branding at this company was walking her dog by my house the other day and she says, hey Mark, <laughs> how would you like to hear your voice in 65 different languages? And I was thinking, well that sounds great. And then afterwards I thought, well wait a minute, <laughs> what does that mean? You know, you'd have to really work out a deal if you're gonna like, yeah. and, and that, then you put 65 people out of work if they if you're doing that. There's so such a thing as name, likeness, voice. Yeah, of yeah. course. So when we talk about, um, you know, I was asking that question whether you feel that if you're part of a massive training, whether that's an infringement. The courts are trying to figure that out right now. And like in the just in, in the um, the case of Sarah Silverman, there was a court ruling that said that I think it was Sarah Silverman's case that because her work was just part of a mass. It's, it's a fair use. It was pointing that way to a fair use. And so that's kind of where the court seemed to be heading. It's kind of a quantity approach. And Moya, you were testifying in Congress on behalf of creators and artists. And how did that go for you? Because Congress isn't really known as being necessarily the deepest when it comes to technology. No, but Is I... Is that too kind? <laughs> I was there talking with a lot of Senate staffers who themselves have academic and scientific backgrounds, so they were very interested in the tech 
tech side of the AI issue, I am less interested in the tech side of the AI issue and more interested in how we can protect human artists from their careers and livelihoods being taken away by generative AI. Um, so you, several times we've been uh, talking about this name, image, and likeness issue. Uh, that's one of the, the policies that the Human Artistry Campaign is really trying to push for on Capitol Hill right now because there is no federal right to control how your name, image, voice, likeness um, are used in the media. And so that's why you end up with voice clones or image clones um, that really rocked at least the music industry a few months ago. And one of the reasons that the Human Artistry Campaign really blew up in their activity. Um, you can look out for some policies that are going to be about name, image, and likeness, this right to publicity um, in, in the coming months mm -hmm. because we really need to have legislation um, controlling how AI is used, how generative AI is used. So could you, does it mean if someone does that, I could sue you and there's something to protect me about that versus it being in the air? In the air? In the air, like up in the air, like, oh, well, oh, yes. there's no rules around this, so yeah. I potentially could do this. Yeah, exactly. And there, there are some states, California, for example, that do have laws in place that say you can't just use someone's name, image, and likeness, but that's not federal. And all of the states have different uh, details about how that law is uh, enforced. So um, once we have a federal policy, then we have protection. And where's like the companies that are they're using these tools? They're also, they should be held accountable. Oh, I agree. The, the human artistry campaign agrees. We are uh, not just working with the government to try and get policies in place. We are also trying to get the individual software developers to commit to having ethical practices, to commit to having transparency in what their algorithms look like so that we know what type of data they've used and we know how much of that gets put into the, into the output. Um, and we wanna make sure that when, because it's gonna happen, when artists' work gets put into these algorithms, they should have consent first. You should opt in to having your work used in these training models. You should get credit so that you know when you've generated something whose work was used, and those artists should be compensated for it. Yeah, and that's, the opt-in system is an interesting one, and Toby, you and I have spent a lot of time talking about that. Why don't you um, kind of explain a little bit about what your company does and your approach when you're training your models? And, yeah. uh, and first, just to set the stage very quickly, just what it is that your company does yeah. so that people understand the context. Yeah. Um, so uh, Lore Machine is a story visualization system that converts t human textual IP into multimedia assets. Um, so it's kind of like mid-journey, but instead of a single prompt and then a single image, uh, you can put in a whole script or a whole book, and out the other side you can get animation, imagery, video, audio, soundscapes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, we look at it kind of like a synthesizer for writers, um, specifically to empower writers to own more of the production process. Um, so we, like, I come from the world of creation. I spent 16 years building Vice Media. I'm a filmmaker and a writer by trade. Um, and so I come at these challenges uh, very sensitively, um, and they are divisive inside my, my own existence. Um, and yeah. so uh, we've made sure to um, include uh, like, a, like a, just a whole range of trip wires inside the software in order to protect what are essentially like core ethical values of ours. Um, so Which mean the participant or the, those that are in the training set are participating, consenting, and essentially, therefore, sharing in the compensation that flows. Yeah. So the the well the where it that's starts, what we mean by an opt-in system. Where it starts is um, we actually. Uh, you have to consent to having submitted your own original text to start with. We do not do generative text. Um, so that's a decision that you make before you use the system and you sign off on that. You can use the system without it. Uh, you can get there, um, but you take on that responsibility. Um, so that's number one. Um, number two is we prohibit specific artist references and prompts. Um, so basically we convert like a novel into tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of prompts that then dictate which media assets come out the other side. Um, and there's no reference to artist prompts there. Um, when you pick your style preset, which is like best to think about it like a synthesizer where you're like picking your sound, um, you, uh, there's a 
a marketplace of presets. Um, so we work with specific artists to develop niche models that are reflective of their work, and the artists receive 100% of the proceeds from those stylistic preset market. Um, uh, additionally, um, we only use generators with an opt-out clause. Um, I have my own kind of like conf conflicted feeling about opt-out versus opt-in. Um, it's a challenge for the industry. Um, but I think maybe the biggest thing is that we are generator agnostic. And what that means is that when you enter the software, you're not working with one model. You can pick models based upon what matches with your value systems. Mm -hmm. um, so if you say, you know what, Midjourney does not have um, stringent enough terms and conditions, but stable diffusion does for me, I can pick that model and swap it in and swap it out. Um, and so, you know, it's not solving all of the problems but it's giving humans um, a level of composability and a set of decisions to, to make, like to essentially navigate their experience and their creation process alongside of what they, what they believe in. Yeah, it's directionally getting to the, um, to them to a point of active participation, right? So it, you know, that's an interesting approach. And Eric, let's get into more about how AI and generative AI is being used in the media and entertainment business today. And then we'll get into some of the future. Um, and I, there's an ultimate question I want to ask everybody too. But Eric, how, does, how do you, does your company use generative AI? And what do you see as the opportunity? You know, identify one big media opportunity for the streamers out there. Sure, sure. Well, you know, I think people and, talk. And give a little context too of yeah, your, what your company absolutely, does. Absolutely. So I'm the president of Cineverse. Uh, Cineverse is a entertainment and technology company. Um, we really are doing two things. One, we're uh, trying to build the Spotify of video. So um, if you think about the top 10 streamers in North America, uh, they represent uh, a whopping 2.7% of all of the film and television content that's been uh, created since 1950. So we're missing a few things. Um, and then number two, if you can imagine the technology it takes to do those kinds of things, um, you know, a lot of the problems that we're all talking about here today, I want to be able to opt in or opt out. I need to, you need to have the effective uh, systems like a PRO to be able to pay people uh, that have opted in and so on and so forth. Um, but the bigger picture is we're, we're, we're using a lot of the technology we have to think about how, where is this going and how do we build systems uh, to create that, the next generation of entertainment. And I think one of the big things that we are really looking at is how do you, you know, today, generative AI, when it comes to video, um, you know, you talk about training set, training data. Um, the training data today on video specifically um, there's very limited data today. In fact, you know, most of the training, you know, most of the LLMs out there today uh, are really focused on textual based information or individual images. Um, most of the training data for video is really goes back to a few limited training sets that exist that were created, you know, 10 plus years ago around social video. So if you talk about, you know, where where this is going, or maybe if maybe some of you fear where it's going, some of you embrace where it's going. There's a lot of opinions about it, but the data sets that exist today are very, very far away from saying, "Hey, you know, create breakfast at Tiffany's, but put this actor in it or something like that." Right? Th those systems are impossible to do today, simply because the data sets don't have not been trained on that kind of information. So but how long will it be before that's possible, do you think? Or will it not be possible? Well, it, there's, a couple, there's a couple levers to that. One is the regulatory yeah. side. Yeah. Are we going to, as a society, allow that? Um, two is the technical side, right? The sheer amount of processing power and data to build systems to do that level of generative AI um, are the exclusive playground of the largest companies in the world. Right? Rick, you're next. Um, <laughs> you know, Fang, uh, uh, and so on. Um, but, um, you know, I think in order to do that, you know, 
you have to basically take a, a, a piece of con a, a content, a movie, a show, and you have to scan it to a level, you know, most, most of these language models are basically descriptive tags of what is happening, right? Um, so how do you have descriptive tags at a level of depth that allows you to do full length movies, right? Uh, it would take, it takes an incredible amount of processing power, computer vision. Uh, you need to have experts that are watching. And you know, we talk about language models, we, we assume there's a, you know, there is a man behind the curtain and it's, you know, some of these large language models have 40, 50,000 people sitting at screens. It, is that what's in the screen? Yes, typing, it's, there's literally armies of people behind the curtain training the models alongside this data. And then if you think about video information, the density of information that it takes to create that is infinitely more complex. So I think it's, you know, we see these videos of what looks like monsters, you know, I've seen some of the commer fake commercials and things I'm sure you've seen of, you know, uh, generative AI generating a commercial, someone's eating a hamburger and it looks like a fever dream or a nightmare. Um, that's because the training sets are so limited and so basic that that's the extent of where it is. And you've, you know, it's, it's been incrementally improving. What's going to have to happen really if we want to go down that path, number one, we have to figure out how we're going to pay everybody, how we're going to allow it, rights, and all of that. And then once we figure that out, then you have to build the systems to basically massively process everything that we can get our hands on. And then ultimately you have to say, and then there has to be a business model for that, right? Because if I say, hey, I want to watch RoboCop, but I want a, a different character in it than Peter Weller, um, and I want it to be a comedy or whatever, however I want to you know, do it. Number one, you know, the, for me to do that, what do you have to, what do I have to pay for it to be worth it to everybody to do? Yeah, yeah. Right? So I don't know that there's even a business model yet because the power it takes to have one person create something like that. I think what we're going to see on the business model side really is going to be, you know, much like, you know, in 1900 when someone popped into a Nickelodeon, it's a far cry from, you know, Avatar, but it was the genesis that led to Avatar. Yeah. Right. So, so Rick, um, I want to ask you about that. So media and entertainment companies having Intel inside. Do you think that it's, do you think that we will ultimately get to a point where what we were just discussing is going to be possible? Where, and let's put copyright protection aside. Well, we could start with sports, you know. Okay. I think um, it's, it's a much easier conversation to have because of in the ownership model. And right now, with the, just as an example, with the Olympics, um, we are working with a company that's allowing us to understand um, almost like scene recognition, but what's, what's the maneuver, what's the trick, like if for skateboarding, for instance, um, what's the 360 loop, or what's the McTwist, or understanding and being able to dive into the archives and resurface, um, you know, historical uh, athletes and maneuvers based on what they're performing in the given sport and then serving that up for broadcast to say, oh wow, you know, gosh, they, they seemed like they were influenced by this particular athlete. Um, you're probably seeing a lot, you know, there's tons of data that's being mined right now for football, for, for Major League Baseball, you know, um, and, and just being able to track the data and be able to surmise on that and how to, um, you know, put all that into a given, uh, given you already have the a lot of the training sets already for home runs, for, you know, for, um, dunks. What's that? Dunks. Dogs? Dunks. Oh, dunks. dunks. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Slam dunks. Thank you. Um, yeah, for... for Very any, specific. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> NBA, right. All those different sports. So it's, it, I think it's, we're, already, we're already creating that. We're yeah, already we're already well on our way, oh, wait, right? Well, for you're sure. bringing up, I just think, like a really good point, and you, both of you did, because like looking through archives and videos is so needed. There's so much content out there, and how do you surface the best stuff depending on the need that you have, right? And so I think that's where AI is going to be really amazing for that curation and content of the past to the present. But then, you know, you were talking about Mid Journey, yeah, or any of those videos you saw that were really creepy um, of the, of like, 
the AI version of something, but you look at an app called Showrunner AI, I don't know if you saw the story, and they built out the South Park episode. And it was yeah. eerily on point. Yeah. Fake. And so eerily on point that they decided that they're not going to go public with the company yet because of what could happen, the, how detrimental it would be for entertainment. Right, for the, the commercial opportunities, right? Yeah. You know, because, oh, and, and I just want to say one thing about that from a legal standpoint, forgive me, but it's important. Um, I was asking Mark before about if somebody was training on Devo songs or on your film scores. And that's closer to maybe there's a consensus that, that that's you know, treading on some fine line, no matter how you feel about copyright protection here. But if it, you know, there was a recent Supreme Court case that was talking about substantial similarity. I'm not going to get deep on this, but substantial similarity for copyright infringement. And it changed the case to being more about taking commercial opportunities away. And so I think that that comes into play when we're talking about AI and entertainment and the arts. So I think that um, you, know, you have that. I would urge people to kind of follow what the Supreme Court's doing. And because a lot of those in, I'm not gonna say insights, <laughs> but a, a lot of those rulings will be brought into this world and used in both directions. And I would love to know, like, from everyone, like, do, do you think this is an evolution of what we saw in, like, remixes and mashups, right? Like, in a way, to, on steroids. So, and artists would see something being done with their work and would decide, do I want to take this down because it sucks and this is not a representation of me? Or do I want to empower you as an, a new artist, maybe, an emerging artist, and say, hey, I like it and let's monetize together? I think we're going to see more of that. I don't know if you uh, know the big story with this guy, Ghost or a person, yeah, who knows, yeah. um, where they submitted uh, their song for a Grammy, right? Obviously trolling all of us. It was uh, a Drake and... That was the fake uh, Drake, yeah. And I thought that was the Travis Scott song. Was it Travis Scott? Was it Travis? Yeah, he made a... a there was a maybe, a no, Travis. he did it for Travis. He's done a lot of them. He's but this done a lot, is, but the one that was, the that Grammy was going one up that? for Grammy was the Travis Scott I thought it was song. Drake in the Weekend, but yes. maybe. Who knows? I mean, they're, both, they're both fake songs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. But like, I think it brings up a really interesting thing. Like, We all know that... He knows, or they know that they're not going to get a nomination, but it brought up a conversation, right? And I do think it's similar to like the beginnings of social media when you had people streaming a concert or putting up a video of something or like reporting about something. And the decision was made from a platform, from the uh, studio side, from the record label side of what is fair use and how we're going to flag it. And I think this is what's going to happen with this, where they flag it and they take the monetization away or they flag it and they decide to let you monetize it, or they decide to collaborate with you. These are things that will end up happening. And I do believe it's the responsibility also of these tools, like you mentioned, and the platforms. What are they gonna do too? But, well, that, one, that one's a flagrant example, right? You've taken someone's specific voice and you're, you know, you're... But yeah, oddly you've, enough, you've, the video hasn't Mark's been taken voice. down. Wait, they have not taken down that video, which means, and I wonder, because TikTok hasn't taken it down. So well, the, why is that? Because it's like the lyrics are original. They were generated with AI, but the the voice part, the one that we are all saying is absolutely not okay, that falls under name, image, and likeness, yeah, and that's yeah. not protected federally. Right. Okay, so, sorry, I, I, I want to get into a, a couple things because we have limited time, and I want to get into the ultimate question that I think is an ultimate question um, that talks about humanity and creativity. But each of you... I'd, uh, I'd love to ask, what do you think right now is something that people may not know, but is a really interesting use of generative AI in the world of media and entertainment? Is there anything that sticks out as this is something you should check out and without making any judgments on how it's doing it? Toby? Um, a space that I'm particularly interested in is called composable diffusion. Um, and it solves a lot of the problems. It opens up another Pandora's box of problems, but it solves the problem um, that was mentioned earlier with regards to data coverage. Um, so basically the only way you can build a large language model is by having data that's properly labeled. Um, and so what composable diffusion does is says, okay, instead of having text in and something else out, which is unimodal, uh, you have multimodal, which is composable diffusion. So essentially you can have 
music and image, and that equals video, or video, and that can equal text and image. And what happens is the cross-references reference start happening. So for instance, sound effects are very well labeled on the internet, which means that if you have water as a sound effect, and you have the image of water that's labeled properly, your ability to make a water video increases markedly. At scale, what happens is that you start to solve for some of those problems. So as an AI nerd, that's a very interesting possibility because it means that it shifts the paradigm once again exponentially towards multimodal um, generation. Rick, what is one example that you, you know, you mentioned the Meg, but is there anything else that is like a really mind blowing that is worth checking out? Well, I think in, in virtual production, and I think you, you're crossing into some territory like you talk about with uh, copyrights and, 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 and usage, but when you think about the LED wall and you're thinking about it, in virtual production, you have these LED walls, you have these environments so you can recreate any given uh, location and imaginable. So what you see, what the, what the director is seeing in that camera point of view, whatever they're seeing pretty much ultimately gets. I mean, if you're familiar with Mandalorian and that workflow, um, you, you see what is in camera is what, and maybe some tweaks to it, but ultimately what gets um, on screen. So. In real time, a director can decide, you know, they're looking at that given wall, that LED space, and they can say, wow, you know, look, I, I don't like that way that looks, I don't like the lighting, I don't like the color, I don't like some of the objects that are in that screen. Now, obviously, what can we put on that screen that is, um, you know, in, in that contained environment and, and, and is delivered through the IP that they're working with can be put on that screen in real time to make those changes so your uh, you're, you're above the line people, your actors, you know, everybody else that's working in that given set, you're not wasting the time. Because you just realize, oh my God, uh, you know, I, I've got a scene that I don't want to see on screen. And then on the other side, of, on, on the flip side of that too, I think in regards to continuity, like for instance, if this was a big, if this was something critical in a given scene, the actors take a break, they come back, and for some reason that water bottle's not on the table. But the set design, the, the individuals that are responsible for the continuity forgets that's supposed to be there because they didn't look at the shot, what have you. You have AI that can tell you what's supposed to be in that scene. So months later, you don't have to come back for a reshoot. So those kinds of things I think could be you know, extremely valuable and where I think AI can come and assist. Okay, so we're getting down to the wire, but I want to start with you, Mark, with the, what I think is a, you know, a, like, a, as I've said, ultimate question. Do you think, can AI generate creative works that are fully novel and original? Do you think that's possible? You know, I think art comes in all sizes and shapes. And, you know, when you start talking about, oh, that sounded pretty much like a real song. Songs are easy, you know, they're short, they're simple, and they're, I think they'll never do a, uh, be able to, I have to I have to write a write a score, and then I have to go and write it out on 80 tracks in in my computer with different instruments in it. Because a director 40 years ago, a director would come to my studio, and I'd sit at a piano or a keyboard, and I go, "Okay, here's the love theme, here's the 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 bromance theme, here's." <laughs> Here's the fight theme. And I play them out on these, just one instrument, and they go, oh, OK, that's great. Can you make it sure it's really aggressive? Or can you make sure it's really sad when you do? And you, you go, yeah. And then you just put it all together. Then you went into Abbey Road or wherever, or Sony Studios, and, and you have a 90-piece orchestra there. And they play it, and they're like, oh, that's amazing. Now, I write the music for them, and I have to do 40 to 80 tracks of of synthesizers, uh, I mean, you know, like sampling and stuff, and it doesn't sound like the orchestra, but it sounds like the orchestra. It's like people can't, people don't have any imagination anymore, and so my workload is so heavy, and then I go and I record it, and it sounds a hundred times better with real people playing it. But, so for me, I'm hoping there's an AI, <laughs> there's an AI app that lets me write things, you know, on a keyboard, on three or four instruments, you know, crucial instruments. Then I go, okay, this is the orchestra size, this is what my intentions are. And I can get that just so I can do a presentation for directors and producers who are, who have no ability to um, imagine what you're going to do with an orchestra. But do you think, 
Do you believe there's something, be, uh, you, Mark Mothersbaugh, as a human being, that cannot be captured by AI, so whatever you create cannot be, for lack of a better word, will, will not, is not possible to come from something that is purely artificial? Yes, and if that's important to you, then you can, you can dial it that way and you can make your art much more uh, from the human and much more organic. Uh, I mean, so much art, I mean, look at Devo. We were doing things with all electronics and, and sequencers, and we were making it robotic on purpose back in 1979. Yeah. You know, we, th we were into that. We wanted to sound like robots. And, and um, you know, it's just through the years I learned other things. It's like when, when I got into animation, I found out how important having 80 people on a, you know, in an orchestra sitting there playing along with an animated film, which, I mean, you know, it, animation's good, but it doesn't show everything that's happening in, in, out in the field yet. They don't, it doesn't really. I mean, you, you can't really fake it. It's, there's, there's like insects eating each other, and uh, there's, there's a, a billion blades of grass growing, and things are moving in the air. And just to have 80 humans in a room, and, the, and they hit the first note and they start playing, it, it would never be exactly the same every time unless you used, you know, uh, electronics, and then you have the exact same C sharp 500 times in the movie. And even uh, people that aren't really that familiar or have that sophisticated a taste in music, they can hear that. They can hear the difference between, because every single time people play in my orchestra, they, you know, maybe they just got off the tube and walked into Abbey, or, or, they, or it's raining outside, or they have on a, a sweater, every little thing, and they're, every little human movement and sound and essence is, is in humans doing it. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, you can, like, you can fake it for 30 seconds in a TV commercial, I'm sure, yeah. you know, and you could get it pretty darn real, but Listen, I, I just don't feel like it's something, I'm not afraid of it. I remember in 1973, AF of M, my first union I was ever in, I'm also in WGA and SAG both too, so. But, but I remember AF of M sent out letters and said, you cannot use a Mellotron. And what a Mellotron was, was just this instrument that had a keyboard in it, and each note played a tape against this um, spindle, because uh, they thought people were gonna start listening to Mellotrons instead of orchestras. You'll be putting your fellow artists out of, musicians out of work. And, and it wasn't like that at all. I mean, yeah. people heard it for a couple of times. You know, first time you hear somebody play, you go, oh, wow, that sounds like a violin and a flute. And then after about a week, you realize, oh, a violin and a flute sound totally different. Yeah. Well, That's my feeling. Yeah. So the no. industry so changed, wrong, but it didn't but like, go away. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, and on, on that note, I have to end it, but thank you, everybody, for being part of this. Thank you, Peter. Thanks for all of this. And I'm sure you all have a lot of questions, so maybe track down some of the people on the panel. Um, but thanks for coming.